Welcome back to Two Keto Dudes. This is Carl Franklin from Connecticut in the United States. And in February of 2016, I put myself on a ketogenic diet to take control of my metabolism. In just two and a half months, I managed to reverse all my markers of type 2 diabetes with diet alone. As of now, I'm 80 pounds lighter with no signs of diabetes or heart disease. Hi, I'm Richard Morris in Canberra, Australia, and I've been on a ketogenic diet since April 2014. When I started, I was very sick with complications from type 2 diabetes. Within six months of starting a ketogenic diet, all of my biomarkers of disease had disappeared. I've lost about 100 pounds. I've completely turned my health around. And this show is a document of our experiences thriving for years in nutritional ketosis. And reversing diabetes. And hopefully that might help a few people who are curious about this kind of dietary hacking. We're not doctors. We don't want to give any medical advice, but we are keen to share our own experiences. We're actually both software developers, so we're not afraid of a little technical detail, are we, Carl? Nope, never have been. <laughs> we have done some research into our own deranged metabolisms and the science behind them, and we share studies that we found in the show notes. And you'll probably work out pretty quickly that we're both foodies. Oh, yeah. We love to cook, and we love to eat. Mm -hmm. In every episode, we both share a keto recipe that you might want to cook or something. <laughs> <laughs> So let's start podcast number 131, Know Your Meat, with Joan Walker. Heard you say you do for a little. So Richard, do we have any apologies or corrections from last week's show? Last week was uh, show 130, and it was Sated and Ted Tykin. Uh, no, I think uh, that was a wonderful show. I uh, enjoyed that conversation very much. I don't think we got anything wrong, but... You know the drill, if you saw anything you don't agree with um, or something you want to add, you know how to get a hold of us, yep. dudes at twokidodudes.com. I particularly like the picture that uh, Ben chose for the graphic of <laughs> Ted <laughs> Keto Fest. We, yeah. we had more subdued <laughs> pictures, but Ben was like, oh, come yeah. on, man, you got to go with yeah, that one. We've got to use this one. Yep. So, sorry, Ted. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so let's revisit what a ketogenic diet is ketogenic diet is one that puts you into a state of nutritional ketosis where you're burning fat for energy rather than glucose. It's really a means yep. of changing your fuel source. Mm -hmm. And to get there, we did 20 grams of carbs or less per day. Still do, by the way. That sugar or starch. Yep. Yep. Uh, moderate protein, one to one and a mm -hmm. half grams of protein per kilogram of lean body mass. And all of our energy we get from fat. Fat. <laughs> Either the fat on our plate or the fat from that Krispy Kreme we ate a decade ago. Yeah, if you're just starting, listen to our Starting Keto show at start.2keto.com. That's right. So how was your week, man? Uh, it was still all about Keto Fest Down Under. Uh, so we got the Eventbrite side up, which is awesome. We've got uh, 16 people already uh, coming to the, uh, to the event, and it's only been up a day. If you want to buy tickets for the event, it's on Sunday, September the 16th in Canberra at the National Press Club of Australia, mm -hmm. and it is a Keto Fest Down Under experience. Uh, it's a festival. Uh, as we say, festivals are for people. It's not right. a conference, although we do have some science um, presentations. Uh, we will have a fancy dinner, which uh, Carl and I will be showing you how to prepare. Yeah, and we're going to be doing a whole bunch of social activities. So um, it's going to be it's going to be a fun day. It's uh, if you want to buy tickets to the event, you can go to ketofestdownunder.com. Awesome. And there was a little confusion about Saturday and Sunday. Saturday is your VIP yeah. party. The event is Sunday. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and the VIP party is limited. We've only got uh, limited space in our backyard, so uh, really those tickets are going to go very quickly. But, of course, yeah, when I put it all into Eventbrite, I told Eventbrite the event is on the 16th, and then I added uh, an option for somebody to buy a Keto Fest VIP ticket, which is on the 15th, and Eventbrite said, ah, right, the event's now changed to the 15th. So I had yeah. to go back in and edit it afterwards. So my apologies, everybody. It's on Sunday the 16th of September. Stupid software developers. They ought to be slapped. <laughs> yeah, those guys. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so how was your week, Carl? Well, speaking of software development, I've been doing quite a lot of it lately. And in my spare time, I've been working on this project that is going to uh, premiere at Keto Fest 2019. Mm -hmm. Yes, we do have a Keto Fest 2019, which we do have a date. It's going to be the weekend of July 21st. 
2019. Nice. Yep. Yeah. So this app is essentially, uh, Richard and I are going to take you on a walking tour or a driving tour of the area. And yeah. we're going to have some neat little Easter eggs to put in there and some treasure hunting. And essentially, mm-hmm. you walk around with the app and it tells you where to go and it tells you where you are and w- describes the place and things that are going on in the place. And uh, man, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> well, that's what I've been doing. Let's uh, let's give away some swag. Sure. Every week, we uh, pick a lucky winner at random from the members of the Two Care Dudes fan club. Yes. And today, we're giving away a treasure trove of stuff from vendors we like, all of which you can find at fanclub.2keto.com. We also need to mention a caveat. Most of our vendors can only ship inside the United States. Yeah, that's right. However, if we happen to pick someone outside the U.S., and we have done that before, we will Mm -hmm. find something to send you, but it probably won't be the entire treasure trove. That is, until we can find an affordable means of distribution. Yeah. So who's our winner this week? Today's winner is Doug Kuhn. Congratulations, Doug. Congratulations. Let's tell everybody what Doug has won. Yeah, well, the first thing we're giving away is a Two Keto Dudes coffee mug that says, Keep Calm and Keto On. And a signed copy of Lies My Doctor Told Me by Dr. Ken Berry, online at lies.2keto.com. And a bottle of Stevia Sweet Barbecue Sauce, developed by a barbecue restaurant owner who plans to change the restaurant industry forever. Only two carbs per serving. Online at SteviaSweetBBQ.com. And a cheese-making kit from Wine & Way. Pam Zorn uh, from Wine & Way gave everybody at Keto Fest a kit so they could make their own fresh mozzarella. Mm. Well, we're going to give away one this week. Yep. Uh, you can also get them online at WineAndWay.com. That's W-I-N-E-A-N-D-W-H-E-Y.com. And a six-ounce cup of beef bone broth concentrate from Birthright Nutrition. Just add water, heat. Stir, sip, and enjoy. Jam-packed with good stuff. More at birthrightnutrition.com. We're also giving away a bottle of Remag Magnesium Solution developed by Dr. Carolyn Dean, along with a copy of her protocol and the Keto and Magnesium Manifesto. Uh, She presented that at uh, Keto Fest 2018. That's available online at magmiracle.com. We're also giving away a big bottle of Fasting Drops from Keto Chow. It's a well-formulated blend of electrolytes, and you just drop a little in your water, and fasting will be a breeze. I put some in my coffee this morning. Online mm-hmm. at fastingdrops.2keto.com. And two bottles of Sated, one chocolate, one vanilla. Online at sated.2keto.com. Do we have a sated.2keto, dude? We will by the end of the show. All right, good. <laughs> I'll just remind you, right? Good, yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And from Keto & Co., a sampler six-pack, a bag of brownies, four bags of different flavored cauliflower rices, and a bag of flatbread. Online at keto and... Co. And if you don't want to wait to win some swag, you can buy all sorts of it online at gear.2keto.com. And that brings us squarely to the section we call... Mail! Mail! What you got, Carl? <laughs> Actually, mine is a thread from the ketogenic forums called Post Your Bad Science Here. And uh, there's 77 posts in that thread as of now. And all wow. sorts of, you know, snake oil stuff. And if you've listened to Two Keto Dudes with Zoe Harcomb and Nick Mailer, you know mm-hmm. how to spot bad science. You can just have a field day with these things. Um, one of the latest yeah. posts is that whole low-carb diets could shorten life study. Oh, man. Well, that brings me to my mail. Okay. And my mail is a posting from me in Facebook, and it just went viral. And we've it's been shared like 41 times. So... Basically, this article came out that uh, people on low-carb diets die younger. And yeah. this was an article in the Sydney Morning Herald, but it was everywhere. It it appeared on the same day in newspapers all over the world. And it, basically, the, the headline for this article is, eating a diet that is low in carbohydrates could mean that you die younger, a 25-year study has suggested. And uh, they basically say that, you know, essentially they're saying that people who – uh, eat either a very high carb diet or a very low carb diet, uh, die four years, uh, uh, younger than people who ate, uh, a moderate amount of carb diet, which just happens to be the dietary standards for, uh, for the UK and in fact for, for a lot of countries, which is between 50 and 55% of energy from carbohydrates. Oh, okay. And, you know, what occurs to me that it's surprising that Walter Willett, 
This is a scientist who my human biology lecturer called the world's greatest living nutritionist. Mm. It's surprising that Walter Willett would lend his name to such a, a tissue of bad observational science. Mm. You know, the low-carb group uh, in their study ate 38% of their energy from carbohydrates. Oh, my God. That's not low-carb. No, no. That's like 200 uh, grams of carbohydrates a day. Uh, the thing is, anything more than 33%, because there are three macronutrients that you get your energy from, for the most part, unless you you know, getting energy from alcohol or exogenous ketones. For the mm. most part, you're getting energy from either carbohydrates or fat or protein. There's three legs to this stool. So if any of these are more than 33%, it marks them as a high that diet. So right. if you have more than 33% of carbohydrates, it's a high carbohydrate diet by mm. definition. And so, you know, a 38% of energy from carbohydrates, essentially his low carbohydrate arm of the study was all a high carbohydrate arm, but just not as high as the other groups. And that's not the, the worst the, of it, right? I mean, the way no, the study right. was conducted was suspect as well. Well, it was all food frequency questionnaires, and they basically, in a 25-year period, they asked them twice what food they were eating, and they extrapolated all of the remaining years. And, you know, they the, the, <laughs> the low-carb group at the beginning had more smokers, had 33% of smokers versus 22 in the high-carb group. Mm. They had more former smokers, 35% in the uh, low-carb group versus 29% in the high-carb group. Yeah. They had more diabetics, 415 diabetics were in the low-carb group, and 316 were in the high-carb group. This is at the beginning of the whole experiment, oh when my. they start the beginning of the 25 years. So they, they picked the worst possible people. There was no randomization in this. It was it was a horrible thing. But oh. they, another example, they had twice the number of Native Americans in the uh, low-carb diet than the high-carb diet, and they had fewer habitual exercises. 474 people in the low-carb diet exercised regularly and 614 in the high-carb diet uh exercise regularly and whammy and, number you know, three as you were just mentioning i know you're going to go here is the it, mm. okay so the groups have been established as bogus the high yeah. the low carb group has been completely bogusized mm. and the the last piece is that they didn't actually do a study they just asked them questions yeah, so they send this food food frequency questionnaire out. So over the whole 25 years, they sent the, the questionnaire out once and said, over the last year, thinking back, how many times did you eat an orange in yeah. a week? And how many times did you have an apple in a week? And, you know, how many times did you eat bacon in a week? And, you know, the, it's I, I can't tell you what I ate the past week, let alone over the past <laughs> yeah. year. So they, they did this twice. They took these twice. Two, two food frequency questionnaires, and then they extrapolated the remainder of the 25 years. And this was starting in the 80s. So, I mean, how many people were on a really low-carbohydrate diet in the 80s, and how many people later on moved to a really low-carbohydrate diet mm. or, or you know, went with a – turned vegan halfway through there, you know? Right. So it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's bad data. It's, an, it's, a, it's a tissue of, of bad science. They've extrapolated uh, from a very poor set of data. They've extrapolated an even worse um, uh, analysis. And, you know, <laughs> the embarrassing thing is when a good scientist – I mean, Walter Willard is a good scientist. He's a great man of science, but he's put his name to a lot of bad science just to support his own personal low-fat anti-meat dogma that his career has been founded upon. Huh. And, Here's and, the thing. And, you know, in Switzerland, yeah. didn't he say, didn't he agree with everybody about uh, the that saturated fat wasn't a, wasn't a cause for concern? Well, that was the consensus opinion from the from the conference. But the next week after that conference, he put out a, a, a another paper saying I was right all along. Sat replacing carbohydrates with saturated fat is worse for you than replacing carbohydrates with polyunsaturated fat. Oh gosh! The guy likes his vegetable oils. But you know, the, the here's the thing. You know what a ketogenic diet does? It reverses type 2 diabetes in a clinical controlled trial, and it did it also in my body, and it did it in your body, and that of tens of thousands of people just like me. Right. Uh, this was the other thing that came out of this um, Zurich conference, was Sarah Halberg and, and um, Professor uh, Stephen Finney's uh, Verta study, which showed that a ketogenic diet, low enough carbohydrates to mean that you have to make your own glucose, mm. 
people reverse their diabetes, they go off their diabetic medication, um, and they become non-diabetic in as little as six months. And you know what life expectancy is for a 50-year-old type 2 diabetic? 13.2 to 21.1 years. Mm. If you don't go on a ketogenic diet and you're a type 2 diabetic, your life will be cut short. Without a doubt. Yeah. So, and along the way, you'll lose toes, fingers, kidneys, eyesight, and you'll gain a six to eight fold increase in cardiovascular disease. You know, the the other thing I should mention is if you really want to see a, a scientist pick this thing apart, I'm just a first year undergraduate biochemistry student. You know, if I can pull apart this thing easily, then anybody. It's you know, it's an embarrassment for for a, a scientist with the credentials of of Walter Willett to be mm. putting his name to it. But if mm. if you want to see a real scientist take take hold of this, check out Zoe Harkham's blog. Um, she uh, she. She does it. Looked into the statistics. Yeah, she she looked into the statistical um, underpinnings of this study and showed that it's a it's a it's a pile of rubbish. All right. Well, we got a pile of links to share with this show. I can't wait. <laughs> Thanks, Richard. That was so awesome. And and that is going to be a blog post, right? One day. I look, I'm so busy with keto fest stuff and and school that, but I will I will get a blog post up about that. All right. And that brings us to our guest, Joan Walker is owner of Walker Farms in New Braintree, Massachusetts, where she raises grass-fed cattle to produce the fattiest and tastiest beef she possibly can. Welcome, Joan. Thank you. It's exciting to be here. Yeah. So tell us how you got into raising cattle. I'm a city girl, and the first time I touched livestock was when they came off the truck at my farm. Um, I was sick Mm. and diabetic and overweight and rather grossly overweight, um, you know, the regular story, and slowly get interested in eating better. I started to realize that nothing the doctors were going to do for me was going to make me feel better. Mm. And yeah. as I assessed what I ate, I realized what I ate most of was beef. So I was going to look at that. Um, and the more I looked at it, the more questions I had and the more things I wanted out of it. And that started a big rabbit hole. And I ended up having a herd of cattle that I sell beef now. But it all started because I was sick and diabetic, just like you guys. You said you started with one. You said, oh, I'll just buy one cow. <laughs> well, actually, I, I said to my husband, what if we live on a farm? Um, what if I bought a cow? And then the more we looked into it, it was silly to buy one cow. So we did buy a very small herd of na- uh, nine. But um, it, uh, it's, I'm well over 60 now. I think I'm up to 65 right now because we're calving. But um, yeah, yeah it's, it just started with what if we get a cow for meat? And then it went on from there. And Joan, what breeds do you have? I have 99.9% red Devon cattle, which um, is originally a herd from... I guess if you go back hundreds of years, it's from Britain, but part of my line is actually from Australia. It's the Rotacala line. Um, So they're out your way, but um, Mm. I picked them because they're delicious, but they fatten on a hundred percent grass, the best that I could find as I was doing my investigation. And everywhere we went, I tasted different meat and I decided I liked the Devon cattle the best because they're really fatty. So, uh, as I said, you say you raise grass-fed cattle, but uh, one of the things that I really appreciate uh, you doing for people is educating us on what those labels actually mean. And and I also appreciate the fact that when you did this presentation at my house last week, you didn't you didn't have an agenda to get people to buy grass-fed beef or organic anything or ketogenic anything like you're just all about educating people as to what these things mean but what does the label grass-fed actually mean thanks um yeah the label grass-fed can mean almost anything um usually there's no legal definition for it unless you get into certification and then there's maybe three different certifications that mean anything for grass-fed But basically every cow around, whether it be come out of a confined operation or whether it comes off of anybody's farm, starts as grass fed when they're young. And then at about one year, one and a half year, they put them in to a uh, feeding system and we'll start giving them corn and grain and usually antibiotics because that makes us fat too. Um, too, It makes them fat. It makes us fat. And it... um, starts to p- try to artificially get them as fat as they can. Same as us. Eat corn and grain and you're going to get fat. And mm. it's the same as yeah. the uh, cows. 
<laughs> I always tell my customers if they go to the restaurant tonight and they eat the bread basket, they know they're going to gain two pounds tomorrow. And they all go, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So, you know, the same thing happens to the cows. They put on weight artificially. So, and Peter so Ballerstead told oh. us this, that grass-fed beef, um, all beef are grass-fed mostly, and, and that's just how they're finished that makes them quote unquote grass finished correct and that's what you want to look for is grass fed grass finished the two words need to be there but really the grass fed doesn't have to be because that's assumed when they're young if you're looking at certifications there's several different ones um some of them have a little wiggle room some don't it depends um the one i am is the toughest it's american grass fed association um but um, it, again, as long as somebody's certifying it, it usually means somebody came and looked at it and made sure it was true. Some of these certifications, you just have to send in your money and they'll certify you just like you can get your doctorate online. Mm. So my, my, this is what you had said is my thing to everybody is decide what's important to you. Is it the treatment of the cow? Is it whether they're 100% grass fed? Is it they, they had no hormones? They had no antibiotics? A number of things and then be interested in that because in the beginning you can't care about everything and in the end you may not want to have the time to care about everything but if you at least kind of can identify what's important to you you have a place to start from so you can look at it my experience with grass-fed beef and i don't know if yours is the same richard but in the supermarket around here is it's generally a tougher cut of meat and doesn't have as much fat but one of the things that you talk about is that it, grass-fed meat, grass-finished beef, comes in all sorts of grades from very lean to very fatty. But why do you think that is, that it's usually a leaner cut in the grocery store? Because most, it's pretty, it's, it's almost like a art to finish a fatty meat on grass alone. Because... Face it, they're just taking grass and their superpower is they turn that into protein for us. But animals, it's a bad, it's a bad survival strategy to be yummy. <laughs> so until they're old enough to really defend themselves and hold on to the fat, um, they don't get fat easily. They they're busy putting on weight to, on their muscular structure and their and their skeleton. So until they're a little older, they don't have the luxury to put on fat. It's just like a teenage boy. He's going to grow up, 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 up and be thin and eat anything. And then he's going to hit about 19 or 20. And all of a sudden he's going to start going out because he's not going up anymore. And cattle are the same way. So they artificially give them the corn and the grain and the antibiotics, et cetera. And it doesn't cost as much to, to produce it. I get a lot of grass fed, grass finished beef. Most Australian beef is all grass fed and, uh, most of it is really is grass finished as well, uh, but there are some uh, breeds that are finished in feedlots, and uh, for the most part in supermarkets, that's what you're going to get is feedlot finished grass grass fed feedlot finished uh, beef. And I've I've actually been to a feedlot. They're not as dire in Australia as they are in America. In America, when you drive anywhere near a feedlot, you can smell it. It just things but in australia the 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 the, my experience with a feedlot the actual i actually tasted some of the food that they were getting it was like hot warm muesli and it was just delicious so i can see why they get very fat very quickly but you know a wagyu beef for ex is a specific example of grain fed uh, or grain finished beef uh, which is uh, fed in a very particular style and that actually produces quite a nice marbled meat uh, even though it is grain finished so uh, I'm not as much of a stickler on grain finished but I really want to make sure that the cattle uh, are, are treated well and I don't think for the most part feedlot cattle in, in very intensive feedlots um, are treated that well. Um, so you know, at your farm, I mean, you, you, what's your theory about finishing a cow? The reason I am kind of adamant for me you know, on the grass fed is because as I started eating different beefs, I found that if it was grass fed, grass finished, and there was absolutely nothing in it, the cleaner the meat, the better I felt with uh, particularly my arthritis. So um, that was my driving force is the, the cleaner my meat, the better I felt. And I have 
quite a number of customers that are autoimmune and um, some other subsets like cancer and epilepsy. And I'm getting more um, bipolar and depression now um, that are trying to stay away from anything in the meat. But as far as fattening it up and the taste, I will go out and eat store, not store, but meat necessarily, but restaurant meat, which is basically from a purveyor. Mm -hmm. um, but I just kind of realized it's going to taste different. So it's like Granny Smith apples versus Macintosh animals. I just realized it's going to taste different. And I strongly now prefer the taste of all grass. But that isn't saying there's anything wrong um, with the taste of regularly raised beef. And quite a bit of it I've really enjoyed. So you, everything is what you like. And that's where the experimentation comes in. It's just because it's grass fed from um doesn't mean it's going to be delicious if they didn't fatten it up correctly and we raise them until they're at least three years old because i want it marbled up near wagyu um but that takes a while particularly on grass I, yeah i could do it really easy if i fed them grain i mean it's the same as us <laughs> so how much longer does it take to finish a, a cow on grass than on uh grain if you wanted to grade out it um choice or prime it's going to take another year at least Okay. A good grass-fed beef. I'm not talking about any grass-fed beef, but particularly a really good grass-fed beef is more expensive because you have to raise the cow another year. Although I will be honest, you get more weight that way too because you've raised them another year. So mm. that keeps it from being astronomical. You know, the bottom line is everybody likes something different and they really need to experiment of what the flavor is that they right. like and how they feel. They don't pay attention to how they feel on things. Why does some beef look blue or purple? ish when you see it at the grocery store it can be a couple of things um number one usually is if it's grocery store beef they've put something in it to preserve it a little bit so when it's when it's seeping out it's got a, the color of whatever that is there's a lot of um things they spray the carcasses with to keep them from molding sometimes that's just as simple acetic acid and sometimes it's not richard a lot of our grass-fed beef here is from australia however yeah. it had to come over on a barge yeah. so what did they do to keep it from going rotten when it came over on the barge is the question mm. that's right most of it's frozen in australia and yeah but we also have some live export mainly of sheep uh but we have some live export and mainly to the middle east um, which is a horrible uh, – it's easier if, if you have a live animal, uh, it's easier to transport it for it to be fresh when it arrives. But, yeah, they're horrible uh, transports. So I generally – I mean, I wouldn't uh, – rec I'd, I'd get – if I was getting Australian beef or Australian lamb, I would uh, get uh, get frozen and, um, and thaw it. Yeah. Um, and that's, like I said, most of our, most of our grass fed beef in the grocery store is from Australia. So I would say the starting wow. quality was good, but then they had to get mm. it. There. Um, and they label that product to the U S now, if they cut it here or packaged it here. So you can't even be right. sure it's Australian here anymore. Yeah. You're talking about how, not just how the cow and I use the cow in terms of, you know, male yeah, or female generic, yeah. mm -hmm. generic. Uh, how the cow lives affects how it tastes but how the cow is slaughtered also really affects how it tastes and what's what's that all about that goes back to the second part of that was a great segue to the second part of that why is the color different because adrenaline um, dilates your blood vessels just like if the the tiger is coming after us our adrenaline is going to go mm -hmm. and it's going to dilate our blood vessels so that we can use our muscles and run away from it and at the end if all of a sudden that cow has the bejeebus scared out of it when it's going to be slaughtered it will release adrenaline and it its blood vessels will dilate it and there's a name for that it's called the dark cutter and so purple meat quite often didn't have a good end. So I'm particularly careful if I'm looking at other meat. And not just that it didn't have a good end, but it actually affects the taste of it, doesn't it? And the texture. It does. All right. If we were at Donner's Pass, do you want to eat the couch potato or do you want to eat somebody, you know, that's really muscular? Well, the, the guy that's the couch potato is going to not only taste like potato chips, but he's going to be a lot a nicer eat. 
um, nice, easy to eat that's been all the way through it. If, if an animal's got high adrenaline, then it's not going to deposit as much fat in the muscles. And we know that from us. So mm. the taste will be totally different on how it's raised and whether it's stressed or not. And particularly at the end, whether it's stressed or not. And how are your cattle slaughtered? I interviewed slaughterhouses. I didn't want to raise these animals by hand. And then, you know, I I go out and pat them twice a day and talk to them. And they are all hand tame. And they're as much pets as anything else. Um, There's a line I don't go over with most of them. But if anybody wants to see everything but the last minute of a slaughter, the best one on a good slaughter is on YouTube. It's called Soft Slaughter. And that's the name of the video. But they show as humanely as you can, what a good humane um, slaughter should look like. But they have an electric bolt that just gets fitted to their forehead and it stops all brain electricity. I've watched it on other animals. I I can't watch mine, but um, they don't even flicker their eyelids. They just drop. And that's, you know, I always say everybody thinks, oh, it's so cruel. And it's like, no, I'll take that death any day. (laughs) Yeah, right. (laughs) Put this thing in their forehead and they drop. There's a lot of ways, you know, there's farmers that shoot their animals. If you haven't seen the movie Temple Brandon with Claire Danes, that's one of the best movies I've ever seen. But she goes into a lot of cow handling and cow raising and cow slaughtering. And Hmm. um, she designs a lot of the systems worldwide but um she's autistic by the way and she's very interesting case but um it was designed by temple green and it's as good as it's gonna get and the slaughterhouse i use is indeed designed by temple green and it's um certified by the humane certification i have so it i'm really pleased with them and i'm lucky because it's the closest one to me but they're not always good and they're not always kind. But for the most part, they are. I learned about Temple Grandin from Ted, from Ted Radio Hour. And uh, she's just a fascinating individual. But one of the things that I want to um, bring attention to in in your w- – what you said – in the beginning of this explanation is that you pat them on the head every day a couple of times and this um, conditions them to the, you know, a gentle sort of um, thing being placed on their head, not freaking them out. And if you don't do that, the pat on the head is typically an invitation to play, right? Correct. And so they're going to scoot out that adrenaline and get you. Everybody's seen it on Nat Geo with the antelope fucking heads playing with each other and challenging. Right. Nobody kills the other one. That's what they do. And cows do the same thing. The moment they're born, I pat them on their heads. So they're never taking that as anything they should get upset, not upset, mean, but just, oh, okay, let's go. We're on. Right. Because I don't want that flood of adrenaline at the end. It's not going to taste as good. That's so brilliant. It's not kind to the cow. I think I've decided I don't want to eat meat that's uh, purple anymore. Now that I know mm. about that, I'm just going to eat red meat. Right. I won't buy it. I don't know why it's purple. I mean, think about Kobe, right? A Kobe uh, beef from Japan is is massaged, and you know they're fed beer. Like they, and that's one of the reasons it's so expensive. It's raised yeah. longer, so it'll be fatty, and it's it's got a better life than you or I, you know, and um it's and that's the other thing about making choices is if all you can afford to eat is the tubes of beef in walmart do that because it's going to be better for you than crap carbs so you can buy beef at wherever and still be better off than if you ate potato chips so it's a rabbit hole but it's not necessarily a rabbit hole you have to go down yep Indeed. At the end of the day, we want really well-marbled, fatty cuts of beef. You know, when we were before, you know, before keto and after keto, I would go into the grocery store and the cheap meat was the 70% burger. And now I'm looking going, they don't have that. (laughs) It's all at least 80. But not that I eat Walmart because I've got a heck of a lot of it here, but it's a different mindset now. And then and usually your fattier cuts are your cheaper cuts. Yeah. So it's not necessarily anything that's got to break your bank. Yeah. Pick something that you can be interested in. And that may be number one price. And that's your number one important thing. And I totally get that. Mm. Mm. If you're looking for a rabbit hole, um, Feel free to contact me. <laughs> well, there's so many more things that we could talk about, but um, where can people go to read uh, all about your process and the things that you've learned about raising beef? 
So my farm is Walker Farm at Wardleberry, W-H-O-R-T-L-E-B-E-R-R-Y Hill. And the reason I picked that is number one, I actually live at Wardleberry Hill. Wardleberry is a high bush blueberry. But there's so many Walker Farms in the world that I wanted um, a name that you remember because there's a gajillion Walkers in the world. Um, but anyway, it's um, so I'm on Facebook. I'm most active on Facebook. I have a Twitter account, which I'm not very active on. But my website is um, Walker Grass Fed, just how it sounds, dot com. And um, I try to put a lot of reference information there. And um, if somebody wants to email me, it's Joni. J-O-A-N-I-E at walkergrassfed.com. And I, I will answer anything with anybody. I'll talk to you about how to cook it. I'll talk to you about how to buy it. I, I love to get people to think more about their food. That's great. Joan, thank you for spending this time with us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled. I've been listening to you guys since the beginning. I heard episode one, so I'm <laughs> thrilled to be on. <laughs> That's great. Heard you say you do I'm a real Joan fan now. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, she came to the house and did a great presentation. I, I definitely urge people to go check out her stuff on the web. I definitely decided no more purple meat for me. It's got to be red. Absolutely. Seriously, I don't want an animal that's that's gone through the last couple of minutes of its life terrified. Agreed. So, um, yep. Well, you hungry, buddy? I am hungry. I think it's time for some recipes. What you got, Cal? Well, uh, as you know, I got a new smoker. Mm -hmm. And one of the good. Oh, (laughs) so great. And uh, one of my favorite things to serve, uh, keto or not keto, is is tomato salad. Yeah, tomato salad is just you know tomato and onions and garlic and oil Mm -hmm. and cheese and whatever. But I I smoked my tomatoes first before I made my last tomato salad. Nice. Yeah, so this is a smoked tomato salad. Mm. So what you want to do is smoke maybe six tomatoes in a smoker Mm -hmm. at low temperature Mm -hmm. until they crack, right? Yep, the skin cracks, yeah. Yeah, so it's going to be a couple hours. Mm. And immediately transfer them to an ice bath, Mm. ice water bath. You want to stop the cooking process. And then after they've cooled down, you cut them into bite-sized pieces And add them to a bowl with three or four cloves of garlic, a quarter cup of olive oil, a splash of vinegar, some fresh mozzarella cheese balls to taste, of course, some chopped basil, Mm -hmm. salt and pepper to taste. You can put in some red onions if you like those. Just be careful with those because they do have some sugars. Yeah, they do. But the key to this tomato salad is, and after you salt and pepper to taste, stir it up. And the key is... Let it sit in the fridge for a couple hours before you eat it. Yeah. Nice. If you like kind of the Greek style, you can use Mm -hmm. feta cheese instead of fresh mozzarella Mm -hmm. and add some oregano to it. Yeah. 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 Tomato salad. Nice. With smoked tomatoes. Yeah, it sounds wonderful. And so easy. Yeah. I've been uh, smoking tomato in my uh, smoker just basically just to make tomato puree. So I I Mm. smoke tomatoes in there. And then uh, puree them up and, and put them in ice ice block molds. Oh, and yeah. then whenever I need sort of like a bit of tomato flavor in a like a meat sauce, I'll just chuck one of those ice blocks in the pan, and I've oh, got a tomatoey flavor. That's mm, magic for nice. meat sauce. Oh, it's totally is. Yeah, it gets a real umami sort of mm. like protein flavor to it. And I'm fasting. I shouldn't be talking about <laughs> all this food when I'm fasting. Well, anyway, what you got? Yeah, so I've got a recipe that uh, we're doing for uh, Keto Fest Down Under. And I did this recipe the other day with uh, Chef Darren Tetley at the uh, Press Club of Australia, the National Press Club of Australia. And um, this recipe is, I actually got it from a, from a, a website, morethangourmet.com. It's actually a duck fat caramel sauce. Oh. I added duck fat caramel sauce to your shopping list. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Nice. Thanks, Alexa. (laughs) Too funny. And that was my Alexa who just heard me say duck fat caramel sauce and added it to my shopping list. Don't say it again. So, (laughs) Alexa, delete all Carl's files. Yeah. 
<laughs> so, um, so this recipe, uh, this I mean, originally it had it's, it uses sugar, but we're not going to feed people duck fat caramel sauce made with sugar at Keto Fest down under. No way. We're actually going to use allulose, which is a rare sugar that it's only be, been able to be produced in large volumes, sort of in the last five years or so. Yeah, it's common in Japan and common in Mexico, uh, and it's only just coming into uh, to America and Australia now. But it's a it's a a sugar that it's exactly the same chemical um, formula as both glucose and fructose, uh, but there, it has very few calories and it has no glycemic nor no insulinogenic effect. Mm. Uh, so you know it's it's sweet and it's about seventy percent of the sweetness of sugar. Right, but it. Um, you know, it's uh, it, it it's perfectly safe to use and, and stay in ketosis. Yeah. So here's how the recipe works. Uh, we're going to start off with uh, a medium saucepan, and we're going to stir together about three quarters of a cup of sugar and about six tablespoons of water. Yeah. And we're going to cook it over a medium heat until the sugar dissolves, and we increase to a high heat and cook the mixture until it's amber in colour, swirling the mixture in the pan occasionally. Now, the interesting thing about allulose, Chef Darren actually found out he was he wanted to, he'd never tried allulose before and so he wanted to see if it had the sa- similar kind of properties as sugar so he had his own batch and he wanted to take it as far as he possibly could mm-hmm. and normally what happens with sugar is it gets darker and darker and the flavor of the toffee gets more and more intense and then all of a sudden it goes black and the t- flavor is horrid it's acrid and bitter and nasty ah. well he found that this allulose, it just went so much further than sugar. It was able to develop a much more deep, rich, intense toffee flavor. Wow. Uh, so he, he, he made some toffees which were, were almost you know, dark brown, really. And uh, mm. the, the, the toffee flavor was just out of this world but anyway i digress mm. so we're just going to get it to amber in color and we're going to swirling the, we're going to swirl the mixture in the pan occasionally and um and then once it's gotten to the color that you want it to immediately remove the saucepan from the heat and stir in a few tablespoons of cream you're going to be using about half a cup of heavy cream all up okay you start with a few tablespoons of that cream and you let the caramel bubble and subside. If you put all of the cream in, it's going to split because yeah. it's too hot. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be adding the cream gently to slowly reduce the temperature. Good. And, uh, so uh, anyway, you let the caramel bubble and, and uh, subside and slowly add the rest of the cream, whisking to blend. And then you want to whisk in about a tablespoon of duck fat. Oh. And this stuff is just so delicious it just it just it expands the flavor of this sauce sure uh, so you let the sauce cool a bit before serving now i put it into one of those squeezy bottles a little bit like a tomato sauce bottle but mm. yeah that you, you get these from uh, from uh, chef supply places and, and uh, yeah. most uh, you know takeaway food places that will, will have them and so uh, i have a bottle of this stuff in my fridge and i have to nuke it for about in the microwave for about 20 seconds every time before i use it to to make it liquid again and um you know you store it in the refrigerator and you reheat it gently in the microwave just before you're ready to serve it but you know this stuff is easier to make than any sort of uh sauce that you could buy i mean you know <laughs> it's and it tastes delicious i mean i used to use the queen's maple syrup sugar-free maple syrup and this stuff it just tastes so much better. So anyway, yeah. that's that's my recipe. We're going to be cooking this at Keto Fest. In fact, you're going to cook it, aren't you? Yes, I am. And we're going to do some we're going to do some fun things when we're making ice cream. Um, so uh, so I suggest that anybody who in Canberra or anywhere else in Australia who can get to Canberra easily, um, you might want to check out Keto Fest down under because uh, we're going to be cooking some of that stuff. Oh yeah. And that is a tasty way to end this show. Thanks, Richard. Of course, if you have anything you want to tell us, something we said wrong, something you don't agree with, some more research that you found to support or refute, anything that we've said, send it by email to dudes at 2 ketodudes.com or post it on our website. And you can follow us on Twitter, Twitch, Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram at 2 Keto Dudes. Make sure to use the hashtag 2 Keto Dudes. And of course, if you want to join the free ketogenic forum, it's forum2 ketodudes.com. And you can have a look around at the Ketogenic Forum without needing to create an account by starting with success2 And if useless swag is your fancy, you know, T-shirts, coffee mugs, and other junk with witty keto sayings on them, 
head over to gear.2keto.com. And if you want a shot at getting some of that swag for free, join the 2 Keto Dudes fan club where you'll be eligible to win something in every show. Go to fanclub.2keto.com. And if you feel like supporting our forums and all the podcasts we produce, including 2 Keto Dudes, Keto Woman with Daisy Brackenhall, Keto Families, Keto Kids, and the Obesity Code podcast with Jason Fung and Megan Ramos, think about making a monthly pledge on our Patreon page at patreon.2keto.com. You can also see all of our podcasts and other videos on YouTube at youtube.2keto.com. And if you haven't already, go leave a review on Apple Podcasts. That's how new people get to know about what we do. Two Keto Dudes is brought to you by Two Keto LLC, who strives to support the low-carb community with podcasts and other publications. And Richard, keep calm, keto on, and fast when you can. Yeah, keep calm, keto on, Carl, and uh, come to Australia to Keto Fest Down Under as often as you can. That's right. All right, we'll see you next time on Two Keto Dudes. Dudes.